Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the second of our Christ College lectures. Now, today, it's, uh, or this evening, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Grant McCaskill, who's a Kirby Lang uh, professor in uh, New Testament studies. Um, he's going to bring something very interesting, very challenging to us in and around the area of Bible and autism. Um, autism is a really interesting human experience. When you look at the way in which it's discussed in the different sectors that people are thinking about it, um, it's fascinating, it's diverse, and it's controversial in, in lots of different ways. So at one level we might say, well, autism is something that medicine tells us a story about. But then on another level, uh, the story of autism is told to us at a multiple of different, from a multiple of different places. The philosopher uh, Ian Hacking wrote a really interesting paper a few years ago, looking at the way in which autism was written and rewritten uh, through publishing. And so he pointed to the way in which certain publishers have specialised in autism, and by specialising in autism, they brought to the fore new stories, stories that challenge the medical stories, stories from families, stories from people living with autism, stories that give a whole new perspective on what autism is and what, it likes, uh, what it's like to experience autism. Likewise, there's been quite a lot of work done on spirituality and autism and some work done on religion and autism. But strangely, in the midst of that, when it comes to Bible and theology, there's very little, or relatively little, that's thinking that's been going on in relation to how that story or these sets of stories help us to understand the experience of autism. So I'm absolutely delighted that Grant's going to bring that perspective to us and help us to begin to rethink certain aspects of autism in the light of how we understand scripture and tradition. So Grant, you're very welcome and we look forward to what you have to bring to us. Uh, well, I'm, <clears throat> I'm grateful for that very warm uh, welcome from John and uh, I think the reality of the lecture may well be quite disappointing after that quality of introduction. The, um, the Christ College lectures are intended to provide a context in which academics working in divinity in Aberdeen can share their developing or emergent research with hopefully interested members of the public. So why is someone who teaches New Testament uh, talking about autism? Well, John's already made a comment on that front. This lecture is connected to some research that I've been developing since I moved to Aberdeen a couple of years ago in dialogue with John uh, and also with our other colleagues, Brian Brock and Leon Van Omen, that draws on some of my previous research on the representations of Christian collective identity and Christian intellectual identity in the New Testament and seeks to put those findings into dialogue with the pastoral reality of autism, which has become, I think, much more widely recognized in recent years. The recognized or diagnosed rates of incidence of autistic spectrum disorders have risen over the course of the last few decades from a figure of around about one in 10,000 to one variously estimated to be somewhere between one in 200 and one in 50. Now I'll talk about some of the factors involved in this shift later. But the figures themselves reflect something that probably resonates with the experience of many who are here this evening, which is that autistic spectrum disorders are common, and most Christian individuals or families or congregations will have been affected in some way by the condition. For those Christians who are committed to seeing the Bible as normative in some sense for Christian life and belief, and I think even if this is conceived differently by different traditions, it remains a broad commitment within the church. It invites us to ask, what does it mean to think biblically about autism? And for me, as the chair of one of the biblical disciplines, that's a question I feel some responsibility to engage with. Now, as soon as we ask a question like that, we're immediately confronted by its complexity and the necessary openness with which we need to engage it. Because the problem wasn't uh, labelled or understood as such in biblical times, it's not as straightforward as just finding a few passages that discuss the issue 
and study them exegetically. Uh, there is no section in the pastoral epistles where Paul says, this is how you are to deal with or think about the people in your churches who are autistic. Some have tried to identify uh, autistic characters in the biblical stories and to look at how they are represented and to consider that as in some sense helpful. But I think anyone who's been involved in a diagnostic process around autism, which is a hugely detailed and careful process, will recognize that we really just don't have enough biographical information to go on to make those kinds of judgments. I think instead, what we have to do is to reflect on broader themes in the Bible or passages that speak to analogous or comparable issues and to think about how they might be coordinated with this issue. And we have to be open to the possibility that when we do so, we're making some wrong moves. We're landing on the wrong topics, we're landing on the wrong passages, uh, and that those moves need to be challenged. And as such, I think it's a task that's beyond any one of us. Hence the title of this lecture. <clears throat> it's intended to begin a conversation within the academy. Similar conversations may already be underway at a popular level, and some churches, I think, have made tremendous progress uh, in thinking about them. But they haven't really, as John's already mentioned, they haven't really happened in academic circles. And sometimes the popular use of biblical material reflects this. So the conversation, I think, academically has to begin. And it has to begin somewhere. And what I'm doing tonight is just trying to get it going. As it grows, I think it needs to pull in other New Testament scholars, other disciplines within divinity, and of course those other areas across the university that conduct scientific or medical research into autism. But also I think crucially, it, as it grows, it has to pull in non-academic partners, churches, families, and individual Christians who have experienced the condition. If the academic conversation is to work, then it has to be driven by that kind of connection with the daily lives of Christian communities. And the range of partners in the conversation then, academics, non-academics, that requires us also to think about our different angles of engagement with the topic and to be sensitive to the language that we use. Uh, language that's appropriate to the historical critical dimension of biblical studies may be inappropriate or even unhelpful to a pastoral discussion. And being sensitive to how we name and therefore how we think about the pastoral elements may drive us to think about issues in the texts or issues in our own disciplines quite differently. And we'll see some examples of that as we move through our material. So I think we probably need to begin with a brief overview of autism or autistic spectrum disorders. Um, many of you, I'm very conscious, will know more about this than I, but we need to say something about it, not least because the research is always developing uh, and the language that we use as a result is subject to rapid change. So let's take just a few minutes, maybe five or ten minutes, to get our bearings. Um, I'm going to go over stuff quite briefly. If you're interested, there's plenty of resources online, plenty of resources you can buy. Uh, this is a fantastic little video made for children. Uh, that does a great job of explaining autism in, its, in our contemporary understandings of it. There's also this, this fantastic little book called All Cats of Asperger's Syndrome, which is both a little bit whimsical, um, but also does a very good job of communicating some of the realities of Asperger's in, in particular. Now, when we speak of autism, we are really speaking of a spectrum of conditions with varying symptoms presenting to various degrees and generally now understood to reflect a distinctive neurophysiological development, what's sometimes referred to as our wiring. It wasn't always so. Uh, for much of the 20th century, autism research was dominated by the work of Leo Kanner, who applied the term to a, a narrow category that was marked by particularly severe symptoms which he saw as psychogenic, as, as generated by psychological events. Uh, for various reasons, the work of Kanner's broad contemporary, Hans Asperger, uh, which studied individuals with comparable but less severe symptoms, was largely marginalized. Um, if you're interested in looking further at this, uh, 
Steve Silberman's book, Neurotribes, is a really excellent piece of, of research journalism. From the 80s onwards, though, through the work of people like Lorna Wing, Tony Atwood, Simon Baron Cohen, and through the popular writings of Temple Grandin, who herself has the condition, the landscape of autism studies really has changed. Uh, Asperger's work has been revisited and has given us the label Asperger's syndrome, although the preference today is to use the broader labels autism or autistic spectrum disorder. And we now recognize just how broad the spectrum is. This shift from using the terms of a condition marked by the most severe symptoms to using it of a spectrum is, I think, the major factor in the huge change in diagnosed incidence. And as we try to think biblically about the pastoral reality of autism, one of the challenges we have to accommodate is precisely the need to think about this range of condition, this range of symptoms and characteristics. It's all too easy to allow one particular point on the spectrum to dominate our thinking. Even tonight, perhaps, my thinking about it is, is dominated in such ways. Well, what are the characteristics of the spectrum? Um, people will sometimes joke that if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism which is a quip about the level of variety between individuals. But we can still, I think, identify a cluster of common characteristics. I'm going to talk briefly about these just now. I might draw some more in as the lecture goes on. Most obviously, those with autism can have difficulties with the social interactions that others find normal. And in particular, those interactions that involve nonverbal cues or conventional practice. Uh, in moderation, they may not pick up such nonverbal cues. Um, they may not intuitively recognize how a person's appearance reflects their affect, their mood. And they can consequently seem stiff, awkward, or even inappropriate in their interactions with others and within groups. They will also often lack an intuitive sensitivity to the social niceties of when certain forms of interaction can be considered rude, uh, often being quite hurtfully honest. And in more severe cases, they can appear entirely shut off from their environment or from the persons around them, hence the original application of the term autistic. Uh, across the spectrum, it's also common for individuals to find things like eye contact quite difficult or even distressing. Now, there are various explanatory accounts for this, <clears throat> none of which is entirely without problem. One of the standard approaches at the moment is to consider it to reflect a deficiency or a difference in the development of the mirror system, the neurological system that triggers a mirroring res response to another person's body and gestures. This is often seen as the basis for empathy, as we recognize something in the other person that communicates not by words, but by finely grained body language. Hence, autism is often identified as a condition of deficient empathy. Now, the neurophysiology of this may well be correct, uh, although arguably we know less about the mirror system than, than sometimes people suggest. But whether we should label it with the word empathy is another matter. This is one of those instances where the language we use is potentially quite... Uh, we need to be careful with it. Uh, empathy might be seen as a supervenient quality, as something that arises from a combination of factors and isn't reducible to those factors. In the absence of what would normally underpin empathy in most people, it might be achieved by other means. So, for example, someone with autism might have learned that a certain posture will reflect a particular state of mind, or might have learned that a particular set of circumstances will lead to another. They can still experience empathy for the other person, but their empathy isn't reducible to the neurological firing that might underpin it in someone else. And I stress this because there, there's a, a lot of justifiable sensitivity in the autism community to the labeling of the condition as being one of low empathy or of impaired theory of mind. But of course, one of the things that commonly goes with this is that those with autism often prefer solitude or their own company, 
to being involved with groups because groups are exhausting things to negotiate. Second, and still within the broad issue of social interaction, autism is often associated with non-typical development or deployment of language. Those with classical autism will typically have delayed language acquisition. Those with what's often labeled Asperger's may acquire language normally or even quickly, but will often use it in ways that are non-typical. Now, often people describe this as a highly literal use of language, but again, I think that's probably slack terminology. People with autism may not have a difficulty with the explicit use of metaphor, for example, but they may struggle with a use of language that isn't straightforwardly referential, like sarcasm or like some idioms. This is the one that sprang to mind, which was just a, a reference to Watership Down. I remember reading this as a child and really not, not comprehending what, what this language was communicated. I, I imagined a rabbit getting his head chewed off. Um, now, why language works this way in autism is still a matter of discussion, but it's probably linked in some sense to the point we began with in terms of social interaction, and also to the next one, which is that thirdly, autism is typically linked to an interest in systems. Those with autism will often be highly interested in systems themselves or things that can be understood systematically or mechanically and will often show remarkable interest uh, or remarkable abilities in mastering those systems. Uh, they'll often also impose systems onto their lives. They like routines, habits. They like things to be done in the same way. Um, one of the dominant schools of research into autism today sets this systematizing tendency alongside the empathy one and speaks of an autistic quotient that places someone within a quadrant based on their responses to a questionnaire. And within this approach, those with autism typically are marked by low empathy and high systematizing. Again, it's useful, but the language can sometimes perhaps be a little reductive. And finally, but importantly, autism is often marked by non-typical sensory processing. Uh, more recent guidelines have actually specified sensory processing disorder as a distinct category of autism. And some of the explanatory accounts for the condition see the sensory dimension as key to all the other aspects. In some cases, the senses can be under-sensitive they don't perceive things unless the dial is turned up, so to speak. Often, though, the opposite problem is seen. Senses can be hyper-stimulated. Smells that you think are nice uh, are, to someone with autism, overpowering, uh, and even painful or distressing. Perfumes, hair products, hand soap. Sounds, maybe even the sound in this room tonight, can be piercing and intolerable. Touch can be distressing, particular clothing, unwearable, lights too bright. A lot of the discussion of this centers on filters. Uh, by the time your brain processes all of the sensory information that comes in, it has to filter it in order to, to manage just how much information is constantly streaming in. And if the filters that are in your, uh, in your, your brain aren't in place or aren't working properly or are simply processing things differently, then that sensory information can overload you. And in fact, this flood of information is often referred to as sensory overload. And it's exhausting as the person constantly has to tame the flood of sensory information. Now, just for a moment, think about all of these things in the context of church. Uh, it's a group that tacitly expects a level of interaction from those present. People are constantly communicating uh, with you or around you, but you aren't sure if you're interpreting it properly. The place is full of stimuli. People around you wear perfumes and hair gel. Uh, the bathroom has that cheap soap from a discount store that really, really smells. The sound system has too much frequency in the 1K to 2K region, and you know that that's the frequency in question, and it's stabbing through your head. Uh, and maybe your church has a part of the service where you're forced to shake hands with someone, or forced to talk to someone you've never met before, 
Or maybe the church expects you to do this during the coffee time afterwards. All of which is overwhelming for you because none of it comes naturally. And maybe in subtle ways, and maybe in unsubtle ways, your behavior is difficult for them. Uh, you, you act in a way that they don't understand. Maybe even sometimes your behavior has been quite problematic for them, genuinely disruptive or challenging. Maybe you've had a meltdown. And at the very same time, you may have some very different ways of interpreting the Bible to the ways that you see in the people around you. Uh, and you may have some very different ways of thinking about the life of the church to those you see in the people around you. And all of this is what we have to think about biblically. The material behind me, I, I won't read it, but it, it was a blog post that I came across from a, a journalist who talked about his own experience as someone with Asperger's going to church and feeling that overwhelming experience uh, for himself. So how then do we think biblically about all of this? Well, I'm a New Testament scholar. So I'm going to think about the New Testament, recognizing that there will be other highly relevant material from elsewhere in the Bible, but leaving it to Old Testament colleagues to pick up on that part of the conversation. And for the sake of depth and focus, I'm going to be attentive mainly to the writings of Paul, and particularly to his writings to the church in Corinth, to 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Again, recognizing that as we move forward, other parts of the New Testament have to come into the conversation. As I do this, though, I, I will sometimes indicate how I think Paul's thinking is representative of the wider New Testament. I should also say, before I go any further, that the first point we're going to think of will be the longest and the densest. So if, if you can survive the first point, you should be okay. So... And this is the first point, which is that the New Testament writers demand, require of members of the church, a radical re-evaluation of normality. I think it's fair to say that the New Testament writers all share a conviction that God has undertaken a work of salvation that centers on the story of Jesus and that pivots on his crucifixion. I mean, there's some debate in scholarship about whether all of the writers in the New Testament think about Jesus as God incarnate, some debate about how, for example, Luke understands the death of Jesus within God's plan. But even the hardest of biblical scholars will generally agree that the writers generally seem to celebrate and give thanks for a work of salvation that centers on the cross. Uh, Paul's language is that we proclaim or we preach Christ crucified. And for them, this is something that can't be explained according to the norms of human value and practices. For one, God's victory has been accomplished through an event that hardly looks victorious, through a violent and a shameful death that involves the suffering mortality of a frail body. For another, this has been done for people who don't deserve it either morally or economically, who have no natural capacity to return the favor that God has done for them. Now, that last point is worth probing for a moment. We sometimes talk quite loosely about God's unconditional love or about God's love being gracious, but that language also glosses over some important detail that's recently been explored by uh, John Barclay from the University of, of, uh, of Durham in his book, Paul and the Gift. Barclay picks up on the fact that in the ancient world, the giving of gifts or the showing of grace or favor wasn't as free as we sometimes assume it to be. People gave gifts in the expectation that there would be some kind of return that the person to whom they gave it would one day return a favor of some kind. Now that involves seeing the person to whom you give a gift as having some kind of capital value, some kind of possession of commodities, whether economical, symbolic, or personal, that will one day be useful to the giver. 
There was, in other words, an expectation that the person would reciprocate the giving of gifts, the showing of grace in some way. But Paul sees the gospel as entirely at odds with that kind of value system. God chose the weak things of the world. And remember that word. We're going to come back to it in a moment. God chose the weak things of the world, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are. I mean, that's as fundamental as basic a rejection of the notion that people's value resides in what they are or what they can give by way of reciprocation, as you can imagine. It's as fundamental and basic a rejection of the notion of capital, as you can imagine. And like the other authors, what he doesn't do is try to accommodate either the cross or God's love into human values, but rather he moves on from this to calling into question the whole value system of normality that judges people's worth on the basis of their perceived capital. So if we move on from this particular slide to this one in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, from now on we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. Instead, Paul's way of thinking about value is that it's a recognition of the entirely unconditioned love free, love with which God loves freely, uh, which Paul expects Christians to mirror in themselves. In other words, acts of love that don't expect any reciprocation. But also, he considers those who are in the church to have a value that has been conferred upon them, that, that doesn't recognize any value in them, but sees them as having value precisely because they are the objects of God's love, precisely because he has chosen them. The language of divine choice then becomes significant. The diverse membership of the church is valued as a divine gift from God, which is radically different from human gifts because it doesn't rest on the prior fittingness of the recipients. And as a system of evaluation, that means that we can't judge people. We can't ascribe worth or value to people in the church according to their social capital, but have to treat them with the honor we would give to any gift we had received from God. Uh, that's something that comes out here in 1 Corinthians 12. Look at the language that I've highlighted, where Paul brings together the, the, the language of God choosing those within the church with the language of him giving honor to them. So when we think about the place that those with autism have in our congregations, our first consideration has to be that they are a gift and that they are gifts who have been loved by God <clears throat> and saved by the death of God's Son. Their value doesn't reside in whether they conform to the social considerations that would see people as valuable or productive. Now, I want to pause for a moment and stress this. Discussions of autism often intersect with the discussions of other developmental conditions or other disabilities, such as uh, Down syndrome. And often the rhetoric about these particularly the rhetoric about the value of, these, of such individuals, and often the rhetoric around whether, for example, if, if you can diagnose the condition during pregnancy, whether there should be a termination. Often those discussions revolve around the language of quality or productivity. Can these people be productive members of society? Let me give you one example of this, and I'll apologize, a trigger warning, I'll apologize in advance if, if, if you find this hurtful. But what I'm going to show is, is a, famous, a famous post that Richard Dawkins made. Uh, he actually apologized for it afterwards, and I think that's important to say, or he, he explained it. Um, followed by a response to this by the Down Syndrome Association. Uh, 
So Dawkins commented, if your morality is based as mine is, on a desire to increase the sum of happiness and reduce suffering, the decision to deliberately give birth to a Downs baby when you have the choice to abort it early in the pregnancy might actually be immoral from the point of view of the child's own welfare. And the response to this from the Downs uh, Syndrome Association was to say people with Down syndrome can and do live full and rewarding lives. They also make a valuable contribution to our society. Now, let me stress, I don't want to take anything away from that comment. But there is a risk in that kind of language that we decide to ascribe worth according to whether someone can be a valuable and productive member of society. And that can potentially be a graded thing. So potentially we might see someone with, for example, Asperger's, with the islets of ability that often go with that, as more productive, more constructive than the person with severe autism who will live a life that is uh, constantly dependent on caregivers. This kind of language in Christian terms is problematic. Paul's view is the value of an individual does not come down to whether they can contribute meaningfully to society. And our, our evaluation of them doesn't rest on that either. The value of a person rests on um, the fact that they are objects of God's love and that they have been given to the church, whatever difficulties that gift might raise. Now, I want to press a little bit harder on this because it's quite suggestive. Um, sorry, I've uh, moved over a couple of pages here. Here's the rub. Paul isn't, this is the important point, given what I've just said. Paul isn't writing this to a church that is living accord, in accordance with these principles. Paul isn't writing this to a church that is implementing these new radical gospel standards in the way that it's thinking about its members. He's writing to a church that he condemns for appearing to judge according to worldly standards, according to those old standards of reciprocity and value giving. What seems to have been happening in Corinth is that factions were forming around particularly impressive uh, or charismatic people, uh, whether they wanted this or not, who were being treated with particular honour. So this slide here picks up on this. Some people were saying, uh, I belong to Paul. Some people, I belong to Paul, Apollos. I belong to Cephas. I belong to Christ. I mean, this is a dynamic that we... Uh, we still see today. I mean, insert your celebrity Christian speaker of choice uh, as the person that's really governed your, your way of thinking uh, about your faith or the dynamics of your church. There were also in Corinth divisions that reflected social stratification, uh, particularly at the Lord's table, where uh, those who had, uh, those who, who were wealthy, sat in one room and ate first, and those who had nothing literally the have-nots, sat in another room and ate, if at all, only later. Paul condemns this and sees it as something that's at odds with the gospel and its dynamics. And, and this issue of division, factionalization, stratification, this runs through 1 Corinthians. And it raises something that I think is vital for our reflections. Neither Paul nor any other New Testament writer represents the church as a space in which the values of the gospel will be automatically reflected. Actually, quite the opposite. The church is the battleground of the values, the, places, the place where the values of the gospel and the values of the world will come into conflict. And that, I think, will probably resonate with the experience of many who are here. You've, you've probably had a mixed experience in church, either as someone who is autistic or as someone who has family members or friends who are autistic, you've probably seen an awful lot of love, an awful lot of unconditional love. You've probably also had an awful lot of judgment. 
And again, I want to press a little bit harder on this because it's quite suggestive. When Paul speaks about the persistence of sinful values in the church and in its members, he typically uses a particular word, the word flesh. The battleground we mentioned is the one involving uh, the war of the flesh and the spirit. Uh, This is often masked in modern versions, this, this word flesh, because modern translators often try and capture it in ways that that will convey its pejorative overtones. So they sometimes translate it with the words sinful nature. They sometimes translate it with the expression from a worldly point of view. But throughout Paul, the word that's so often used is the word flesh for these persistent sinful values. Now, there's a lot that scholars have said about this, and it would take us a week to go over it all. Um, But one of the obvious implications is that when Paul thinks about sin, He thinks about it as something constitutional. It's in our bones, so to speak. Uh, It's in the way we are. It's not just something we can decide not to do. To put it another way, sin is instinctive. It's intuitive. It's normal. And that's the really important thing in relation to autism. I mean, we can't, we can't be naive about things and say that the autistic individual's difficulty with social interaction is better than that of the rest of the population. But we do need to allow it to expose the potentially toxic social dynamics that mark our churches, where we value people who fit in, who talk like us, act like us, think like us, smell like us, respond like us. And a sideways glance to the disciplines of anthropology and psychology allows us to see how much of our behavior, how much of what we assume to be evangelically normal, is explicable according to social identity theory, to how groups form their cohesion and their boundaries. Some of these dynamics are good, some are neutral, but some are bad. Some involve precisely ways of including some and excluding others. Some allow certain people to function as alphas and force other people to be regarded as subordinates. Some need to be called in question, and some of our interactions around autism might expose precisely these dynamics. Okay, that's the first of our point and the longest one. From here on, things will be much quicker. So secondly, the New Testament uses concrete images to depict belonging to the body of Christ. Now, this second point really emerges from the first. One of the challenges we face, particularly when we think about the alienating sensory experience of the autistic in church, is to develop meaningful categories of belonging, to foster a perception that members belong to the church. And this is particularly pressing when the persons in question may not have an instinctive or intuitive need to be in community. Now, this is where some self-reflection is important. It may well be the case that we form our sense of belonging through practices that are actually quite alienating for those with autism. What we label the unity or the community of our church may be a function of uh, social interaction, hugs, handshakes, eye contact, uh, the shared jargon, the dress sense, the songs. Uh, In other words, we may form a sense of belonging in an entirely normal way. But as we just said, normal usually ends up excluding some who can't participate in that normality. So it's striking that even when Paul is rejecting normal societal values, particularly in relation to the Lord's Supper, he makes use of a set of images that convey unity and belonging, particularly images like Uh, the body, and like the temple. Uh, Now, those images are found elsewhere in the New Testament too. So, for example, John uses the image of belonging to the community. He draws on the image of a vine, which has multiple parts, but but is all one. Uh, First Peter uses language that's also found in Paul and elsewhere of the church being a a temple, a building constructed of uh, living stones. Now, what's most significant about these, I think, is that as metaphors, they're quite concrete. 
They don't present unity by describing social interactions that someone with autism might struggle with, but by using concrete images. And the use of concrete images is, is quite well recognised as, as a principle within autism studies. Temple Grandin, for example, talks about her own imaginative uh, activity as involving constructing or putting together mental photographs of actual concrete things that she's seen. Uh, interestingly, there's a whole family of research on the use of Lego uh, for uh, therapies for autistic children. And at the risk of being whimsical, if, if you look at that second quote there and imagine how that might be enacted or, or imagined using Lego, you can begin, I think, to get some traction on that. So on a basic level, I think it's important to ensure that as we seek to foster unity and community within our churches, we do so by sustained attention to those concrete images and allow them to inform or even to challenge our social practices. But again, I think we can push a bit harder because Paul uses these images as the basis for thinking about how the various parts of the community seek to serve each other's needs. So to go back to 1 Corinthians 12, which we've to, uh, touched upon a few times this evening, this is an image of the various parts of the body requiring all the other parts. On one hand, it's a helpful and challenging image for those with autism uh, who might in many cases prefer not to be involved in a group and its dynamics like the church. And that in itself, I think, is an important point to explore. But at the same time, it also places a burden on the Christian community uh, that this person, that their needs should be taken into account within the community to which they belong. If one member suffers, the whole body suffers. Now, here I think it's particularly interesting that Paul uses the language in verse 22 of the members that seem to be weaker. I mentioned this word weak earlier. It's a word that's frequently found in the New Testament, often in connection with sickness or disability. It's a form of the same word that Paul used in one of the first slides we looked at of the things that are not, that God has chosen to nullify the things that are. And interestingly, it's also a word that Paul uses in passages where he speaks of a weaker brother whose conscience can be injured by the actions of others that are in themselves entirely proper, entirely permissible, but that this individual struggles with. Now, what I'm about to say is, is a kind of um, exegetically stretchy or, or even questionable point. I'm stretching a point across two quite different issues. In those passages where Paul speaks of a weaker brother, he's really speaking about people with weak faith and with weak consciences who, who don't enjoy the full freedom that the gospel can give them uh, because they don't, in a sense, have a full confidence of faith. But there is an important connection with the way that we think about uh, the autistic because he's speaking about situations in which Christians voluntarily give up or avoid things that are in themselves good out of a sensitivity to the pain or distress that they may cause others. To fail to do so, knowing it will hurt them, is portrayed as ruining someone for whom Christ died. And note again, that way of calculating the worth of a person. It's not based on their reciprocity or their intrinsic value. It's based on, on the death of Christ for them. So here's the point. If you know that there is someone in your church with autism, maybe you should find out whether they're distressed by things that you do. Maybe by the sensory effects of some of your choices. Maybe you need to forgo the perfume or the hair gel. Uh, to set aside your right to smell nice or look cool. Uh, I'm, I'm of a generation that still uses the word cool, by the way, but so is John. Um, maybe you need to be sensitive to those needs. Cinemas, shopping centres, these places are increasingly sensitive to the need to provide sensory safe spaces for the autistic, but churches seldom are. And similarly, maybe you need to rethink whether some of the activities that you consider to be core to your fellowship 
you know, like the coffee time after the service or sharing peace within it, are actually as significant as you think. Uh, And not necessarily do away with them, but maybe locate them differently and maybe just cut some slack to those who struggle with them and shy away from them. That's Christian freedom. That's what in my tradition would be labeled as liberty of conscience. The freedom to give up on good things because you know that they'll hurt other people. Well, lastly then, and I'll really talk about this very quickly and and won't dwell on it in any detail. There's been a renewal of interest in recent New Testament scholarship on the concepts of character and virtue. Uh, These were concepts that to a large extent had slipped from an awful lot of New Testament research, at least in prominent circles, Um, but have become prominent again in the last few decades as scholars think about how the New Testament writers conceive ethics or morality. And basically, the categories of character and virtue shift the focus from thinking principally in terms of commands and obedience to thinking about the moral identity of uh, of the person and the formational process by which that moral identity, that moral shape is developed. Now there's, there's really much more in the Old Testament than in the New that speaks of this idea of formation. You know, think of books like Proverbs in the wisdom literature. But New Testament writers like Paul can still be read in ways that are sensitive to how they represent moral growth and formation, a change in moral identity as something that takes place within the Christian community. Uh, So, okay, why should that be relevant to autism? Well, if we take the notion of formation and substitute a broad synonym, we might see the, the connection. Formation is really a kind of adaptation. Uh, As we adapt and learn how to modify our behavior to the environment in which we live in ways that are beneficial to all. And this concept of adaptation is prominent in relation to autism. Uh, And there have been big shifts in the recognition of the extent to which adaptation can, can be seen and accomplished by those with autism. I don't mean to cheapen the significance of either of these words, adaptation and formation, by by putting them together like this, but simply to note that there's a helpful conceptual overlap. I mean, understood in relation to adaptation, the concept of moral formation can be a helpful one for those with autism, where they see see the need to change behaviour as one of process from a particular kind of um, behavioural pattern to a different kind of behavioural pattern. And indeed, their experience of adapting to expectations might help other Christians think about what transformation involves and looks like. Uh, It should go without thinking that the adaptation in question, of course, is not to social standards. Uh, There is a big literature on what's known as camouflaging, as people with autism try to look, to look normal the way that, that society defines normality. What we're thinking about here really is adapting to God's standards. And there is, I think, a particular traction to this. Uh, one of the challenges that the autistic neurotype can generate is a dark side, if you like, to the preference for, um, <clears throat> for routine and habit. Obsessions can form. Um, particular things can, <clears throat> can so dominate, sorry, can so dominate ac- activity that they become unhealthy. Uh, substances can be used habitually. There's a lot of literature on this. The imagery then of a process of reformation can be a very helpful one for those confronted by those kinds of realities to think about their own experience of adapting to a new lifestyle and changing to new behaviours. Well, let me conclude by effectively repeating what I said at the beginning. I've talked about three areas within the New Testament, all within Paul's letters, that I think are particularly relevant to how we think about autism biblically. You may think there are other areas that are more relevant you may think I've misread these ones. Uh, As the conversation moves on, we can talk about this. 
we also can bring into the conversation um, distinctively autistic ways of reading the Bible, uh, the kinds of distinctive readings that people with, with autism themselves will generate and will uh, hold up. Whatever we do, let's not allow the conversation to stop. There is too much at stake, and there's too much that can be gained that we don't want to lose from the reality of autism that's at once a challenge and a wonderful gift. Uh, I'm losing my voice a wee bit, but we do have a few moments for questions or for, um, for someone else to make points, <laughs> since it's a conversation. If, if, if you're all dumbstruck, then I'm, I'm entirely happy for us to, to close right now. If you do want to ask something, uh, George Coggle's about to ask something, but if you do want to ask something, there, there's a button on the microphone in front of you which you can press, and, and then everyone will hear you. George. Uh, just to start the questions, something that struck me when you were talking about uh, autism as a spectrum disorder. Now, I read something somewhere quite recently, probably in popular literature, maybe even on Facebook, somebody who was autistic, um, complaining even about that use of the term, saying that that was very, still very one-dimensional. Yeah, yeah. And that, in fact, it is much more n-dimensional and I think the example, the, the, the diagram they used uh, was of a colour wheel with various, <coughs> various points fitting onto that. Do you have any, does that fit into your, to the New Testament view? Yeah, I mean that, that's a really interesting point. I mean I think in, in terms of the New Testament view I, I don't know that it can really <coughs> say anything particularly to that except perhaps insofar as that imagery of the body um, doesn't particularly, you can't really take a body, I mean, you could, but it would be fairly gruesome, but you can't really take a body and lie all the bits out in line. You know, all, all the bits are, are, are really quite different and they have quite different functions. And I, I think my obvious response to that comment there is, is that I think it resonates nicely with that image of, of a body that is complex and of a body that interacts in complex ways, in actually quite fluid ways. Um, and I think, you know, one of the interesting things within this as well is, is that even when we talk about the autistic spectrum, we can sometimes have, have quite a fixed notion of where someone's located on that spectrum that doesn't necessarily take into account their plasticity. And, and a plasticity which is always being shaped by interactions with others, e even if for them those interactions have a very different neurological basis, perhaps, or neurological dimension than they may have in others. So I think that's right. I mean, I think, you know, other people who are specialists in autism might, might want to make other comments on that particular image. And I think all of this, again, reflects sometimes perhaps unconscious power games uh, or, or inadvertent power games that, that people sometimes do with language. You know, we, even talking about an autistic spectrum disorder, implies that there's a condition of normality that this is deviant from. That's, that's one issue. But again, too, you know, there is, a, there is an implicit tendency within that to try and grade people. So you hear the language as well of high functioning and low functioning. And, and that language, again, I, I think can be, can be offensive and uh, can also, I think, be quite problematic. Um, you know, the, the most... <laughs> I'll probably regret saying this, but, you know, the, the person that society might deem very normal might be, if you like, a high-functioning sinner. And that casts into light some of the dynamics that we're, we're thinking about. Does that answer your question, George? Yeah. There's one question here, and then I'll come over. So. Um, my son's autistic, and he was here just a few minutes ago. And we've had various responses when we went to church. The first church that we went to, um, we got asked to leave because they couldn't cope with his autism. Yeah. And um, that was incredibly hurtful. Yeah. And for me, it, it goes back to what you were saying about churches seldom empathetic to the needs of autistic people. We then went to a different church 
in Aberdeen, which has got a completely different approach to it, where the first week that we went there, the minister said, the minister said aloud, this is Ben, he's autistic and we love him. And that's a real sense. But I wonder, do you think some churches are scared by autism or, because, or are so ignorant that they just reject it? Mm. Well, you know, I, I think, I mean, in a sense, that's the kind of, uh, I guess, one of the subtexts running through what I've, I've said tonight, that, yes, you know, on one level, I think there is an ignorance of it. Uh, and that's something that, I, you know, I think we're coming through. I mean, even things like that, that video I, I, that I showed the link to, I mean, that's a great little video. Um, things like that, I think, are helpful. There, there's an increasing popular awareness of it. But at the same time, well, A, you know, we often have a lot of stereotypes of autism flying around. Uh, so, you know, again, it's, it's a little thing, and it's not necessarily the same kind of autism um, that, that you're speaking of, but, you know, the Sheldon stereotype from the Big Bang Theory, and th there are other cultural examples that are actually, I think, much more nuanced and much more sensitive. So some of you may know the character of Abed from uh, Community, who, who actually captures wonderfully some of the strengths um, of autism. So I think some of it comes from, from an ignorance that is beginning to be displaced. But I also think that a lot of it reflects the fact that we, we arrange our services today in ways that, um, that conform to normality. You know, they, they conform to a certain idea of social reciprocity. And that's why I've used some of this language about people who respond to things in the same way that we do. I mean, for one thing, you read 1 Corinthians and, and it doesn't look particularly like many of the services we've often attended. Um, and I think some of that reflects, in a sense, it reflects the reality that we saw in, in these passages in 1 Corinthians, that, that people continue, unless they're exposed, unless they're called out, people will naturally continue to operate according to the values of the flesh. And in a sense, it, it, takes, it takes someone to call it out. So, you know, I think often it, it takes a church having someone who is actually disruptive and problematic for them to think again about whether they've set things up in a way that can only really be, be a happy home for people who are, who, who are what, what someone with autism might label a neurotypical. So, you know, I, I, think, I, mean, I, I, you know, I don't have any answers on this particularly. Um, I think it's more that I'm, I'm sensitive from having read this material in 1 Corinthians. And I should say that I found myself reading it quite differently thinking about autism to the way that I, I would have read about it previously. Um, so, I, you know, I think I've got a sense that it, that it bears on precisely what you're talking about without necessarily have, having any particular answer to it. Do, okay, thanks. There was a, a question from further over. Yeah, I'm, just, uh, yeah. I'm on. You're on. <laughs> this may be off topic, but uh, tell me. But I was just wondering whether you thought some of the... Uh, Biblical writers might be on some sort of spectrum. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think, to be honest, I think probably they are. Um, that's as much a statistical observation as anything. I think what I would probably say, though, is, <clears throat> is that while they may be, um, we don't really have enough to go on to be able to diagnose that. <clears throat> you know, we, we, ju we just don't have enough biographical information. And maybe, you know, maybe there's something interesting as, as well, going back to this previous comment about whether, in a sense, I'm not saying this is what you're getting at, but, but maybe in a sense sometimes when we do that, we're, we're, trying to, we're actually trying to pigeonhole people or, or categorize people. Um, and maybe part of the testimony from across the Bible. I mean, you know, the interesting thing when you look across the Bible is that you've got an incredibly mixed bunch of people. And they're not always... They're not always normal in the sense that we might define normality. Some of them aren't necessarily nice in the way that we would define nice. You know, there, there's an incredible mixture of people. Statistically, there probably were autistic people who wrote some of these books, who were members of these churches. Uh, that might explain some of their activities. I think the challenge for us is to look at a picture like that and say, <clears throat> that's actually the normality for, for God's kingdom. The, the normality that's made up of this incredible diversity 
rather than to try to pinpoint where people might be within, within the spectrum. So I'm not, I'm not trying to dodge the question at all, so much as just to think that, um, you know, may, maybe thinking about the question in a different way might invite us to engage in some helpful self-reflection. Thanks. We probably have time for just one last question, so... Uh, the, the big wide one. Um, I was going to say, you, 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 your, your uh, quote of the body and, and all its glory, sort of, uh, and, your, your, and yet at the same time, uh, you're trying not to uh, make somebody better than other people. It's, 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 it's valid, and it's a very difficult thing to do in the one sense, because you're naturally is a in in a certain situations in a lot of situations you would choose the doctor and not the bin man yeah <clears throat> so yeah. it's a very difficult thing to really work um but uh the same valid one and a good one has to be worked out it's a continual working if mm. you like. um but uh in the other sense the bible talks in one sense to the white middle class male, it talks to the functional person, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. And um, in that sense, that functional person is, is told to reverse everything and look everything upside down. And so he becomes a catch-all human being. It's sort of metonymy of, of, of species. You have to pull every... In talking to that central person, you're pulling everyone in. Yeah, yeah. It's a central kind of uh, thing. Yeah, that, that's really helpful. I mean, I think, you know, one of the interesting things when you begin to go down this path of research is that you find that um, there tends to be a, a kind of uh, aggregation of different marginal groups. So you, you tend to find, when you start working in this kind of area, you tend to find the same texts and the same kind of conversations going on around, you know, for example, colour or orientation. And that, I think, is a really interesting dynamic as, as, as well. You know, as you say, um, the extent to which we, we take um, white, white middle class as, as the kind of standard of normality. Yeah, I, was... I mean, I think there are some realities that need to be... I, sorry, I should say as well, you know, there, there's lots of interesting points in Paul where he precisely negates those kinds of things. So, you know, where he talks about there's, there's, no, there's no slave nor free, male nor female uh, in Christ Jesus. Um, but I think there is, there is another side that I haven't talked about tonight that, that I am looking at a little in the research which is, if, you know, if you like, the reality factor of, of ensuring that we do take seriously that, for example, those with autism um, may find certain roles to be challenging. Um, and the church might need to think about whether an individual with autism is right for those roles. But I think that cuts both ways. I mean, you know, I've, I've got a section in some of the research I'm working on that thinks about leadership. And that's actually one of the really interesting test cases because that really presses on that issue of whether we've allowed our standards to be properly inverted, um, whether we, we think that someone with autism should be in leadership or whether we automatically bracket them out of it. I mean, that, that instinct to automatically bracket them out is really problematic. But at the same time, we also need to recognise that, for example, someone with autism in pastoral ministry might lack some sensitivities to certain situations that will actually be quite problematic. So maybe you need to think about how they will be involved in pastoral ministry, um, the, the particularities of that. Um, that's a sort of practicality question that moves beyond the simplicity of, of things, while still, I think, needing to approach that from this basic starting point that our intuitive values are wrong, and that, that we need to call those values into question. So I think we probably need to finish there. So let me just thank everyone who's come along tonight. Uh, some folks have come from quite a distance. Uh, and let me thank those folks who have um, asked questions.
And let me thank John again for uh, his very warm welcome. So thanks to everyone.